All right, guys, just bear with me just one second. Just got to get some particulars out of the way, which I think we've already done. So I think we can go ahead and get into this. There we go. There's my beautiful face. Uh, well, face. Anyway, here's... Ooh, these locks going everywhere. All right, let's do this. So, October 26, 2019, and this is how the frack we got here. I'm your host, the most Will Buchanan, on how the frack we got here. We do take the events of the week and also try to make sense out of it all. Uh, so, for anybody that's ever watched the first time, uh, this is an adult podcast, so language uh, that is not always also clean may not always be used, and videos of graphic image may be shown, so viewer discretion is advised. Um, that being said, guys, uh, it's been a tumultuous week, but we would be remiss if we don't at least uh, talk about the late Representative Elijah Cummings. Congressman Elijah Cummings making a final return to his beloved Baltimore. Inside the church where he worshipped, families and dignitaries paid tribute to the mahogany Marylander. He held himself to a high standard, and that is why I've called him the North Star of Congress, our guiding light. Fueled by a passion for justice, Cummings was a fierce defender of his district, pushing back when President Trump called his city a rat and rodent infested mess. He served in Congress since 1996, rising as a national figure. But it was history and humble beginnings that would shape Cummings' career. The civil rights leader never lost sight that the same kid taunted by white mobs as he integrated a South Baltimore pool could become a widely respected congressman. The impact of his work can be measured today by the hundreds that showed up to pay tribute. His constituents joined by lawmakers and two commander-in-chiefs, Presidents Bill Clinton and Barack Obama. Cummings, who was serving in his 13th term in the House, died last week due to health challenges at 68. In Washington, a rare moment of silence on Capitol Hill as leaders on both sides of the aisle came together to honor one of their own. Cummings was the first black lawmaker to receive that special and rare ceremony. As the chairman of the House Oversight and Reform Committee, Cummings held a prominent role in the impeachment inquiry. And amid the fiery political debate, his bond with his colleagues prevailed past the partisan divide. Perhaps this place in this country would be better served with a few more unexpected friendships. And Congressman Cummings was the son of sharecroppers. He told the New York Times when he brought his father to the U.S. Capitol, his father said to him that his swearing in showed him what could have been possible if only he had the opportunity. Rachel Scott, ABC News, Washington. And that's very true. Representative Elijah Cummings, uh, his, one of the most historical figures um, from civil rights up until uh, his standing with Trump, the man has had many, many, many accolades and honestly should be respected well for it. Um, so definitely um, peace and condolences to his family and uh, rest well, sir. But uh, on a side note, I do love the fact of how your pallbearer is just smooth with past, smooth with past Turtle McConnell. And the look on his face was priceless. But again... Uh, definitely a great service for a very great man, in my opinion. Um, but moving right along, let's get to the idiot in the room. Yeah, I'm talking about Trump as usual, because let's be honest, he's in every shitstorm, there's always that center, the Tempest, and let's be honest, Cheeto is it. And even more so was that he decided to try to distract us uh, from Ukraine by trying to go with this little number. President Trump is telling his supporters that he's building a border wall around the state of Colorado. We're building a wall on the border of New Mexico, and we're building a wall in Colorado. We're building a beautiful wall, a big one that really works, that you can't get over, you can't get under. Okay, so here's the thing. If you're like, what is happening? The president tweeted saying he was joking. There are no actual plans to build a wall in Colorado. It did create some comedy on social media. Governor Jared Polis joked, saying it's a good thing that Colorado now offers full free day kindergarten so kids can learn basic geography. And, I, and, and let's be honest, guys. The, when I saw that, it's, I thought distraction. Just keep in mind, the Ukraine situation is, is unearthing so many worms that this is where Trump uses us from his playbook. He does something to basically distract us from the norm. Building a wall in Colorado and then turn around saying it was a joke is a good way to distract people from the actual truth. 
even more so to the even more so he's still using distracting tactics much similar to this right here remember when he said in his tweet that he the whole entire uh, impeachment inquiry is like a lynching well he decided to double down on that Democrats have used. it's a word that many people have used over the uh, years but that's a word that has been used many times and let me tell you something uh, the level of unfairness for a perfect conversation with the president of Ukraine. This was a perfect conversation. And frankly, had they known what the conversation was, they wouldn't have even wasted everybody's time. But this was a perfect conversation with the president of Ukraine. President of Ukraine and his foreign minister separately came out and said there was absolutely nothing wrong with the conversation. President of Ukraine and the foreign minister came out said there was no anything there was no he used the word no blackmail they said there was no pressure there was nothing done wrong this is a hoax just like there was no collusion after two years they found out and wasted 45 million dollars this is a disgrace that this could happen again guys distraction notice i kept on saying the whole entire time there was a perfect conversation. He mentioned the Prime Minister of Ukraine, the Defense Minister of Ukraine, and then went back to the old tricks. I'm talking about his greatest hits. He's going to go back and say after two years there was no collusion, which was wrong. There was multiple items of collusion again in the, in the Mueller report. Even the Barr report that's what was redacting most of Mueller's testimony still shows that yes, your president, as many of you Trump supporters love to point out, your president is compromised. And so, what does he do lately? He has now decided that all he can do at this point is to simply turn around and make it seem like I'm going to distract you from the truth in order for me to get by. And you don't believe it? Even, even the funny part is, his supporters are on board with him. And we all know his favorite, Lindsey Graham. The president's Trump allies on Capitol Hill today on the defensive. When it's about Trump, who cares about the process as long as you get him? So, yeah, this is a lynching in every sense. Republican lawmakers like Senator Lindsey Graham justifying the president's use of the incendiary term in his tweet, a word that many say elicited racial violence and brutality committed in the U.S. Trump writing of the impeachment probe, quote, all Republicans must remember what they are witnessing here, a lynching, but we will win. Democrats were quick to point out his continued pattern of divisive language. I represent the 6th Congressional District of South Carolina, and I know the historical context of that term. But they also claimed the president was purposefully trying to distract from the testimony of a key witness in the impeachment inquiry. U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine Bill Taylor testified for hours before House investigators about his involvement in the Ukraine scandal. In my Ten short months in Congress, it's not even noon, right? And this is the, my most disturbing day in Congress so far. Democrats pressing Taylor on his now public text exchange with the European Union Ambassador Gordon Sondland, in which Taylor wrote, quote, I think it's crazy to withhold security assistance for help with a political campaign. Ahead of Taylor's deposition, the president distanced himself from both men. They're interviewing ambassadors who I'd never heard of. I don't know who these people are. I never heard of them. President Trump just yesterday called on Republicans to form a united front. But just moments ago, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, in a rare move, broke from Trump, saying, quote, given the history in our country, I would not describe this process as a lynching, but rather an unfair process. Monaco Sarabdi. So again, guys, it is literally as you see it. That's why I was trying to, that's why I keep saying the whole time, these are distractions. Keep in mind, the impeachment inquiry is still going on. Now, what does that basically mean for a lot of people? It doesn't mean a full-on impeachment. What it basically means is that the Democrats are exploring via, via committees and certain inquiries to see if there's enough evidence to impeach. Now, just a quick rundown of what impeachment is. Impeachment requires literally an overwhelming support of, some, of, support of votes from the House and two-thirds of the Senate in order to impeach a president. And trust me, um, some Republicans are willing to fall. Some Republicans are willing to die on that sword for Trump, Lindsey Graham included. So this is why evidence is key. But again, the Mueller report, as I've been saying on every podcast, is a golden roadmap 
to how to get rid of Trump and not only just rid of Trump but his entire administration because as you can tell people are dropping like flies over there I mean just last week we reported that Rick Perry left the EPA over Ukraine so apparently there's a lot of smoke and whenever there's smoke there's a shitload of fire and let's be honest in this case Trump's administration of the smartest people is, is literally burning burning and, per and, and turning out people actually they're starting to have higher attrition rates than call centers but um, but the interesting thing about this is, is as the impeachment inquiry is going on, Republicans are literally losing their minds. And I mean, losing their minds saying, well, this is a witch hunt. You guys have had a chance to look at all this stuff. And even more so, as testimony is coming on, Republicans had the gall to do this. Turn on Capitol Hill when as many as two dozen House Republicans upset over the impeachment inquiry stormed a secure hearing room. Laura Cooper, the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Russia, Ukraine and Eurasia, was getting ready to answer questions at the time, but she had to be removed as Republicans physically got in the faces of Democrats uh, to protest these proceedings. Armani Raju is on Capitol Hill. I mean, this is pretty extraordinary, Manu. Tell us about this. Yeah, it is. Earlier today, the Republicans who are not part of these proceedings railed on the process. Roughly two dozen or so conservatives came out uh, demanding to be part of this impeachment inquiry. Then they stormed into the secure hearing space where this hearing was supposed to take place. And these members came in. They were, some of them were still holding their electronics, which is not allowed in the secure hearing space. But they came in, demanding to be part of it. One congressman, Bradley Byrne, I'm told, got in the face of Adam Schiff, the House Intelligence Committee chairman, and yelled at him about the process. Also, Louis Gohmert, a congressman from Texas, also was shouting about the process in this closed-door hearing. Now, uh, Cooper, the Laura Cooper, who was the witness, actually went left uh, while this was taking place. But one Democrat did shout back. That is Val Demings. And we're told from a source that she said that it's she said to these Republicans questioning what they're doing that saying, is it OK to lie, steal and cheat? So as long as you don't get caught now, these Republicans still have not left the room. Some are still there. The Capitol Police have been consulted as of the sergeant of arms as this hearing has not got yet underway. I did get a chance to catch up with one Republican who was part of this effort, Mo Brooks, and I tried to engage him about the substance about things that have been revealed by the president's top diplomat in Ukraine, raising concerns about how the president apparently wanted in investigations to be announced that could help him politically in exchange for releasing military aid and Brooks pushed back. But Mr. Brooks, Mr. Brooks, the, the, the opening statement says very clearly, this is not, this is okay. what, the opening hold, hold, statement let, me, let, let me finish what no, I'm please, saying, let me no, finish my question. Look, he says you very clearly. You should not be relying on it. Why, why you, should I be relying on his public in a court testimony? Of law, if you were in a court of law, would you rely just on the opening statement of an attorney? But let me or ask the first you, witness can call, I ask you what or would you saying? have cross-examination? Would you allow rebuttal witnesses to determine, to explore whether the first witness's I'm testimony about the was back in Iraq? I'm asking about the substance of what he said. He that said that. make any difference. We don't know whether what he said is true or not because of the sham process that's been. I'm going to go ahead and cut that short just because the fact of the matter is, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Distraction. Um, for so fact, the matter is, yes, there are inquiries going on regarding key people that used to be in Trump's administration, probably still in the Trump administration. What you know, what a lot of people may or may not know. For so fact, the matter is, if you're not invited to one of these hearings, storming them can get you held in contempt. Now, what kind of I'm not gonna say behooved me, but at the same time, it kind of made me concerned. For simple fact, the matter is, Capitol Police is there to make sure that no one else can get in these hearings. These secure hearings are supposed to be secure. They're supposed to have Capitol Police. They're supposed to have the Sergeant Arms who has the ability to have people removed from these secure hearings. And yet you have a group of Democrats, you have a group of Republicans who decide that, you know, we don't like the impeachment inquiries. We weren't invited to the impeachment inquiry. So therefore, we're just going to storm the impeachment. We're going to storm the, uh, the uh, inquiries. And... One has to think, if these are supposed to be secure meetings, how do, pe how do these people get past whatever group this is? And I think that alone is not only concerning, but what else is concerning is, if I'm the 
the chairman of this committee and I'm trying to conduct business and these Republicans are coming through the door and getting in my face, oh, I'm calling Capitol Police and I'm telling the Sergeant Man at Arms, uh, they weed them out. However you choose to do it, we need them out. But again, guys, this is all distraction. Keep in mind, this is what I say about the Republican Party. It amazes me so that you think for exoneration they would go along with it and be all right. Because keep in mind, the scrutiny over this administration should be the same scrutiny level as when the Republicans went after Clinton. Um, I forgot where I saw this on Facebook where it said, keep that same energy that you had about your president that you were so concerned about a man getting a blowjob in the White House. I mean, let's be honest. Republicans, keep in mind the moral, the moral clevity, if you will, of Republicans. They wanted to get a Democrat out so bad that they were willing to sit there and take the fact that he got head in the White House and lied about it. Not the fact that he's compromised national security. Not the fact that he's he's ran um, he's trying to run the Federal Reserve like his own personal piggy, like his own personal piggy bank. Not the fact that he's tarnished uh, international relationships with China, Cuba, Russia, and things of that nature. Um, <clears throat> not the fact that he's trying to increase prices across the board and making certain people's uh, incomes difficult to get by. No, he didn't do all that. Trump basically is not doing all that. And the Republicans went after him so hard that he could get impeached. Why? Because the Senate did not have enough votes. So why is this so why is this relevant now? This is relevant now just because at this point, this is just an inquiry. This isn't a full this isn't a full on impeachment. This is an inquiry. And that alone is where the problem is. Now you gotta think for Republicans to act this damn crazy over an inquiry. Tells you off the bat that there's something else going on here. And even more so, that the rats are starting to sink from the ship. Much like a former, former mayor, former mayor, presidential candidate, and now working for free lawyer for Trump, I think Giuliani may have swung his final swan song. And this is how we know. Giuliani uh, you know, had his phone in his pocket, unknowingly then pocket dials an NBC reporter multiple times which leads to multiple voicemails of Giuliani in conversation he wasn't expecting anybody to hear. It's, you know, okay. Uh, here's uh, an excerpt from one of those calls from last week. Tomorrow, I got to get you to get on Berlin. You got a call? Got a call, Robert, again tomorrow. It's Robert around. The problem is we need some money. We need 20000 I mean, you know, it's the end of that. I mean, first, it, it, look, Giuliani tells our Dana Bash, Juliet, that the voicemail doesn't show anything dishonest. It's not about Ukraine or the president. Uh, look, who knows? But let's just let's just cut to the chase. This is the pre personal lawyer of the president of the United States who's operating as a shadow secretary of state at the president's uh, be be behest uh, in Ukraine and, and perhaps elsewhere, talking about needing hundreds of thousands of dollars related to foreign countries. Whoa. Right. It, it, yes, exactly. Um, you know, first of all, let's just remind everyone that Giuliani was put in charge of cybersecurity at the White House. So everything is actually starting to make sense. I, you know, I think that um, Giuliani's carelessness, both in his public statements and then just moves like this and maybe it may have been accidental um, shows, uh, I think. A so I'll just go and cut it there because it just goes through commentaries. But yes, Giuliani has made some butt dial calls. And basically was going around saying we need to find evidence and dirt and things of that nature. Uh, and also, we need money. We need a few hundred thousand. Oh, wow. Um, hmm. How can I put this in so many ways? Distraction. Again, Giuliani is basically working for free as the president's personal lawyer. And he himself is embroiled in this Ukraine scandal as well. So again, I'm not saying that he's butt dialed an accident. But again, it's like... How much more evidence do you need before you actually move forward? Now, I'm not saying this as to the Democrats because at this point, they're just simply investigating. The, uh, they're, they're investigating an inquiry. That's it. There's no official impeachment process yet. But at this point, it's really starting to get there. And with, you know, Giuliani, Muchin, and everyone else just literally coming around the corner, it just feels like 
it's about to happen, so there needs to be distractions so that we're no longer pressing for it. Or the fact that no longer the public's interested. But let's be honest, the public is very much interested, and we just want to see the man gone. Um, along with everyone else. Um, but in other news inside of business, General Motors did actually have a, did actually meet a, uh, a deal on their labor for ending the strike. And here's the details. We work hard for these cars. We do this so that you guys can have a quality product. If the company is profitable, we want to share in those profits. It looks like it's looking good now, but you know, we're, we've been out here the whole time and we're out here until it's done right. We can be here. 20 years and we tap out at $15 an hour. Now, as great news as that is, there is a, there is a caveat to this. Um, because of the deal they put in place, is again, it's still tentative. It's just that, yes, uh, workers will get $15,000 more in salary and a $5,000 signing bonus, and they will get health care, and for those that are temps, will get a full path new workers. What they didn't say, which I did find on later publications, is that, unfortunately, three GM plants will be closing. And that is sad because, let's be honest, um... When it comes to auto workers, they're going to be needed. And I keep telling people all the time, I tell you, I tell this, and anybody else who ever watches me or knows I've said this many times before, unions are important. They truly are. If it wasn't for unions, we wouldn't have a lot of what we have today, 40-hour 40 40 hour work weeks, paid time off, things, uh, mater uh, uh, maternal leave. We wouldn't have those things without unions. So keep in mind, the United Auto Workers is just one of many unions out there that honestly are trying to get these things, and this is why I say unions are important. Um, just because, and let me just be completely honest here, um, not a lot of companies really care about you as a person. You're pretty much them a number, a seat filler, a person on the line, or just a checkbook, a check mark at a diversity hire. Yes, I said it. Achieve. Nine times out of ten, because the reason why I can say that I've been the diverse, I have been that check in a diversity hire in some places, and I can tell just because you know I'm the only guy with that. Um, but with that being said, though, here's the reason why unions are important. Just because it's a fact of the matter is just that they're able to get these things. And you can go to GM, and GM should be paying more. They have the ability to. Hell, their CEO just ranked in twenty-five million. Twenty-five million dollars is a bonus their CEO was just given. But you can't pay well over seventy-five thousand dollars, seventy-five thousand workers a decent wage. Keep in mind, the minimum wage is still seven dollars twenty-five cents. Seven dollars twenty-five cents hasn't changed since the late eighties. Since actually, I'm sorry, hasn't changed since the seventies. Seven dollars twenty-five. Seven dollars and twenty-five cents an hour, the minimum wage in two thousand in two thousand nineteen. Why has that not changed? But then again, it's uh, why like I said it goes back to what I've said about the whole entire thing. Corporations do not care. Unions forcing corporations to care because unions gonna hit corporations where they hurt their wallet. And like I said, glad that the workers are actually able to get get some things out of it. Feeling kind of sad that three plants are going to close because of this deal. And again, if they, I, I highly suggest if there's not a union where you work, unionize. You need to. Just because so the fact of the matter is if I own a business and my workers want to unionize, go for it. You should have one. But then again, I'm the guy that thinks more about the people that I work for and the people that are working for me and less about my profit. So I guess that would make me a great businessman. But anyway, speaking of business people, um, Pence, who decided to break his silence, 
has decided that he's going to take on the NBA and NFL and the ongoing dispute with uh, China. And I mean this. Blasted U.S. businesses for siding with China. Pence's speech closely watched as President Trump works to complete a partial trade deal. Now, while the vice president emphasized the U.S. wants to engage and not fight with China, Pence cited several examples of China's bad behavior, including intellectual property theft, a Chinese fentanyl in the opioid crisis, and Chinese export of surveillance technologies. He criticized the NBA and Nike in particular, he says, for muzzling free speech in exchange for business with China. Nike promotes itself as a so-called social justice champion. But when it comes to Hong Kong, it prefers checking its social conscience at the door, inciting with the Chinese Communist Party and silencing free speech. The NBA is acting like a wholly owned subsidiary of the, that authoritarian regime. Now, worth noting, in 2017, the vice president, remember he walked out of an NFL game after players exercised those same rights to free expression by taking a knee during the national anthem. Now, the president uh, has remained quiet on supporting Hong Kong. Some have suggested he is uh, keeping quiet to avoid slowing progress on a trade deal. No, he's keeping quiet just because he wants to sit there and agree with what Penn said. Here's the thing. Here's the thing that a lot of people understand. Um, besides saying teapot, have you met Kettle? Um, Pence did actually walk out of a game when players were taking a knee, protesting, ra protesting uh, racial injustice and police brutality over minorities. For all those that still think it's about the damn flag, um, and try and think about this: what Nike, had, what Nike and NBA have done. For all those that don't know, they're still continuing to do business with China. As we all know at this at this current moment right now, uh, China does seem China is having an issue as far as um, inner policies with people expressing freedoms and whatnot, and the government there is trying to suppress that. Many times over, there have been many arrests, uh, people have been hurt, things of that nature. Uh, sites, popular sites, uh, I think like. Uh, Facebook for one point was blocked in China, but any but the thing about it is Nike and them still continue to do business, and Pence is going to sit there and play uh, social social justice warrior, which I think it's kind of funny because Pence also believes that he should be able to tell a woman what to do with her body, and again cites the Bible as the reason. So take that as you will. Um, aside from that, there's really nothing wrong with that. If Nike and NBA want to do business with China, there's nothing wrong with that. There are businesses. Now, I, I understand that, but, but Will, but didn't Nike put Colin Kaepernick as their fate? I said, yes, they did, but I've always sat there and said it best. Nike sometimes put business decisions along with moral decisions. They decided to put Kaepernick as the face of, as the face of their company. Uh, reason being because, well, number one, it's going to get a number tension. Number two, it's going to piss people off. And number three, it's going to get people talking about Kaepernick and Nike. It is simply a business decision. Not something that Michael Pence might not say that Mr. Pence would know, because unless he could shout his Bible at it, suppress it, or just say, I'm white enough that I can do whatever I want, he's going to sit there and cry about it. Um, so, hey, for all those that like going to Cuba, who's been to Cuba, I hope one day I'll be able to go to Cuba, because I just love to see the culture there, especially the car culture there that they have with classic, classic Chevelles and Chevrolet and things of that nature. But anyway, like going to Cuba, um... Well, you might want to hurry up if uh, baby, if uh, Agent Orange has his way. Administration has announced new restrictions for Americans traveling to Cuba, including a ban on cruise ships. The new rules effective today also apply to group tours and most private planes and boats. National Security Advisor John Bolton says they're ending what he calls veiled tourism by cutting off the Cuban government's access to American dollars. This morning, President Trump is wrapping up his three... And that's the thing I don't get. I honestly do not get it. Cuba has nothing to do with us. Yes, it is a tourist attraction. Yes, President Obama did lift the trade embargo so people could literally go to Cuba. That you can fly to Cuba, you can experience it. Yes, it is tourism. But I think it's that single part of history that people should love. People who have the ability to go should go and go and visit and go enjoy. I don't see Cuba turn around U.S. I don't see Cuba turn around U.S. dollars. I don't see businesses that were initially starting up in Cuba, you know, buying hotel property and whatnot. I see them not complaining. It seems to be a win-win for everybody. But again, President Baby Hands decides that hey, I'm going to undo everything the black guy did, 
without citing any reason to block Cuba except the fact of the matter is we don't want our dollars to go there. Again, let's undo everything the black guy did. And speaking of things that are that are completely unjustified, um, this one story I came across in Ohio where this young lady, very nice young lady, is in a cross country cross country uh, track team. Which I'll be honest, if you can run cross country, you the truth. Um, she was disqualified, well, because of her hijab. And I know that it just amazes me so because I know a couple of podcasts back, um, a couple a couple of podcasts back. I talked about a kid who had locks, similar to mine, that was wrestling, and the referee told him to either cut the locks or forfeit the match, and they cut the locks on sight. Don't get me wrong, he manhandled the man. He manhandled that boy like a grown-ass man. But at the same time, you force him to do something that he didn't have to do. And this poor girl now has to endure this. Like, um, like I've been punched. You know, like many times, like I got hit really hard. Um, I just ran this whole race and everyone on the sidelines knew that I was disqualified except for myself and people I was running with. And the race is going to start in 30 seconds. So I didn't expect him to tell me and to completely mentally ruin the race for the rest of my team. Now, I'll be honest, the simple fact of the matter is she just wore her jab. There's, how, how, I'm sorry. This is the part where I have, this is the part where I have so many problems with this. I don't care if you have locks, like mine. I don't care if you wear hijab. I don't care, I don't care anything about your dress, as long as it's representing you. If it represents your religion and whatnot, I can live, I can, I can care less. I don't care if you're dressed up like a Quaker or a Puritan or Amish. I do not care. But the simple fact of the matter is, it's just their religion. And if she wants to run with her a jab, then run with it. Chances are she's probably the fastest person out there. That's the reason why. I almost want to. I almost want to be. I almost want to sit there and say she was probably the fastest person out there for the cross country track team. And they're just in the cross country team. They're just like, oh, we gotta, we gotta figure out a way that she can't qualify. I mean, this is the thing that kills me. Whether it's Simone Biles, which. Any routine she does, they 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 try to bring that down and say that, well, you know, we had to worry about the safety. Because what safety? Has Simone Biles injured herself in any of her routines? The simple fact of the matter is that there are routines named after her now. Or the simple fact of the matter is that she's one of the most dec she is the most decorated gymnastics uh art gymnastic uh individual um in our modern times. But you guys want to turn around and sit there and say, well, we have to we have to make sure some things they just can't do because you feel like you have to level the playing field for those with the same with the same ability. And I feel like that's the same argument that has always been said in time. Much like this case of this young woman who simply is disqualified because of her religion. I think that's personally bullshit, personally. And I think that the school needs to turn around and say Sir needs to really reverse that decision and say no, she shouldn't be disqualified, and that the officials who made that ruling probably should not be a part of any other school uh, activities from here on out. If all they see is the hijab and say, well, she's disqualified, it's not like it gives her. It's not like it gives her an added advantage. I'm just saying. But um, move right along on that. Uh, if you like the New York Times, and I think the New York Times is about to get a bump in subscriptions. And I think it's because of the president. It's taking his gripe with the media to a new level. The White House has canceled its subscriptions to the New York Times and the Washington Post. Now the administration is planning to instruct all federal agencies to do the same. The White House said the move would save taxpayers hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yes, that Trump himself. And the reason, and you're probably wondering why President Baby Hands is literally talking about... Um, canceling New York Times. It's because the, the one of the editors for the New York Times got into it with Trump over Ukraine and pretty much using his own words against him. And even so, that Trump was so distraught, so angry that the New York Times would say so many bad things about him. He has decreed, like the dictator he wants to be so badly, I'm going to decree that we cancel these subscriptions for New York Times. And every other federal agency cancels their subscription to the New York Times. Because this will save the taxpayers money. Um, okay, let me let me stop right there. I looked this up. 
again, this is a distraction. This is a distraction. I will admit that wholeheartedly. But I had to look this up. A subscription to the New York Times on a yearly basis is 150 bucks. If you do it monthly, it's like 29.99. So out of the many federal offices, which I believe there's, I believe there's in there, in all our 50 states, there's at least 15 to 20. So you're telling me we're saving money? That's not even a drop in the bucket compared to how much we could save if we cut the military's budget in half. But again, the only reason you want to stop this publication is just because they said something bad about you, and because they, and by bad about you, I mean they told the truth about you, and you didn't like it. So. Tough titty. Uh, so, for aside from that, guys, because I just thought that was funny, and now I want to get a subscription to New York Times now. But again, that's distraction, and he's pretty much taken away from the fact that it, the walls are closing in. But this other story I have here, guys, which I thought was funny, that I saw, well, I won't say it was funny, I thought it was kind of interesting, where, well, I did not know this in healthcare, um, that there is some healthcare software that might be slightly impacted. More so is that there's a current so there's currently a software program that's used right now to help care for millions of patients is actually being racially biased. Um, that leads to minorities, mainly blacks, getting passed over special care. Um, the software itself is supposed to be able to predict costs rather than sickness. Um, with that being said, it takes into the effect that it thinks that white patients tend to be higher cost patients even though they're not as sick as black people. So the software, because the way it was designed, would let healthier white patients get care, more impertinent care, faster than black patients. And what the interesting thing about this is, they don't want to sit there and say that, and of course, the, the, the bullshit answer they gave was, the problem was the algorithm was built to protect who's going to cost money next year, not who's going to need health care. Let, let's think about this for a second. The problem, was the, the problem was the algorithm was built to predict who's going to cost money next year, not who's going to need health care. Um, so by that statement alone, that tells me how in the world was this algorithm, how this world this algorithm was designed. Because if you're going to sit there and tell me that it's based off that, then that's kind of racial bias in itself. And... And you're right, the OS medical lab after the year. You're, you're exactly right. Because you can't, a system, and this is speaking from an IT situation, it's speaking from an IT standpoint, you can only put so much to an algorithm to it until eventually it shows its true nature. For example, the software that's in design, it, what, it's like they never said what the algorithm or how it came to be that it said it takes cost over individual. It should be equal above all. But again, the healthcare, the healthcare industry in the U.S., it's a for-profit system, and that is the fucking problem. And I and I've been saying that, and now the so fact of the matter is, there's software out there that just predicts that, and that's a fucking scary thought. Number one, it really is. Um, but aside from that, um, and I meant to actually do this other way, like moving move right along. Um, so the federal judge has actually did something which I never thought would actually happen. Um, well, ever since Mueller decided to, you know, give us a report and Barr tried to redact it, it seems now that some individuals are going to get the full report. Late Friday, when a federal judge ruled that the impeachment process was legal. A House resolution has never, in fact, been required to begin an impeachment inquiry, Judge Beryl Howell wrote. Giving the Judiciary Committee the right to review the secret grand jury evidence from Robert Mueller's investigation. Before the ruling, the president insisting that he didn't need a dedicated strategist to coordinate his impeachment message. I'm the team. Then visiting a historically black college in South Carolina. So let me stop right there for a second. It's going to go to my other story, which I, again, I just think that's crazy. But it is good news. The Democrats are finally going to be able to get the full unredacted report. What I mean by the secret jury testimony, they mean that they are actually going to get the full Mueller report, which means they're going to be able to see everything that Barr has tried to keep them from seeing. Again, this will decide whether or not we move forward with an inquiry or an impeachment. We should have already done it, but I understand you're trying to make sure all the bases are covered so Trump can't go running. Um, but again, it's not surprising for the simple fact of the matter that uh, literally and figuratively, uh, Trump is sitting more trying to do distractions. This is just him. It's his distractions. 
even more so, this also was a distraction. Him going to a black college, and uh, this happened. Carolina, where he compared his impeachment plight to the criminal injustice endured by African Americans. And I have my own experience, you know that. You see what's going on with the witch hunt. Touting his record on sentencing reform while complaining that he's being treated unfairly. In America, you're innocent until proven guilty, and we don't have investigations in search of that crime. The president on defense as his Justice Department goes on offense, opening a criminal inquiry disclosed Thursday night into the origins of the Mueller investigation. If somebody has nothing to hide about what they were doing leading up to the 2016 election, then they have nothing to worry about. With more. If that is not the hypocritical statement of the year from the person who literally sat there and said, well, that's just simply not true. That's alternative fact. And the reason why I want to talk about Trump being at, a, at an all-black college, number one, uh, who the fuck decided this was a good idea? It, it, even more so, it makes me even more so for some fact of the matter that we had HBCUs administrators go up to Trump and take a fucking group photo with um, take a fucking group photo with him, and now he's allowed at an all he's allowed at a traditionally black college, Benedict College, which is an HBCU, which by the way, which I I thought it was going to be in the news, it wasn't. That only seven they they invited ten black students to attend his to attend his uh, speech. Three of them had ROTC training. Seven of them actually attended at an historically black college. Seven black people attended. Come on now, I mean, there's just there's just honestly nothing else beyond it. And you know, the impeachment before the 2020 election. Um, I wouldn't be mad about it if it was. I really wouldn't because here's the thing, Trump. Trump is trying to get to the 2020 election. He That's his whole thing. If he can get to the 2020 election, then he can start this whole thing about they try to go after me, they try to say this, they try to say that, they try to bring me down, and then he goes into his greatest hits. Well, look what I've done. I've helped prison reform by doing what? Releasing three people? Three people out of a, out of a almost one, almost out of a three million prison population. Keep in mind, those that are on the lower offenses, you know, for for marijuana, for for uh, less violent offenses, things of that nature, are still incarcerated. I don't see you. I don't see President Baby Hands releasing them anytime soon. He's only released three people, three people, and it's only because Kim and Kim and his and Kim and her bitch husband Kanye decide to sit there and be. Uh, uh, decide to sit there and be social activist and get three people released. Really? That's your prison reform? Bullshit. Uh, when you say y'all's uh, BSN News Network while Byron Allen is in... Oh! Yeah, the Byron Allen lawsuit. Uh, which, yeah, I think that's against... Um, um, you're right. That is against... I want to say Comcast. Was it Comcast? Yeah. Um, which I got, I, I'll get more information on that one, Yolis. I know what you're talking about. I know what you're talking about, Yolis, but I got to get more information on that one because that's still an ongoing case and I am following it. Um, because I personally think that Byron Allen should get that $30 billion, $30 billion lawsuit because he's got, a, he's, he's justified. He really is. But I got to get more information on that. But I know exactly the story you're talking about. And of course, yeah, the Bill Clinton crime bill, which actually led to the, which actually led to what we now know of the private prison population and the, very much the Tunnel 2 prison for profits. The reason why the CCA in Nashville, Tennessee exists, because they have a state contract to hold criminals. You're exactly right. It all came from that Bill Clinton crime bill, which he, you know, swears up and down now that uh, Comcast in charge. Thank you, Yost. Um But yeah, with the way, with Bill Clinton's bill that he put in, uh, that three-strike rule for higher drug offenses, that's what led to all this. But, but again, I shouldn't be surprised now that Trump is now talking about, you know, in, in America, everybody's guilty to prove an innocent. Okay, so let the actual, in, so let the actual inquiry happen and let the impeachment happen. If you're as innocent as you say you are, then there shouldn't be a problem. But we all know that's bullshit because he's guilty as shit. Um, but moving right along, guys, uh, speaking of people who don't, who don't need to be in their jobs whatsoever, Betsy Davos, who's been found in contempt of court for student loan forgiveness dispute. Find $100,000 to keep on collecting from students at a for-profit college, uh, Corinthian College, 
where uh, Corinthian colleges, where kid, where people who sign up for these uh, for-profit colleges thought they were getting degrees, and turns out they were actually getting they were actually getting hustled because the college itself was a scam, and therefore it was ruled that they're forgiven. They would actually um, be forgiven for those student loans because of that. Unfortunately, Betsy Davos and her student loan collecting companies have decided to still continue with this, and yet they were caught. So not only was she fined 100 grand, the education department was fined 100 grand. And this, again, is why I sit there and say so much Betsy Davos is completely and utterly unqualified to be the Secretary of Education. Keep in mind, she bought her damn seat. She's literally still owning stock in a student loan debt company that is still operating with her still a part of it. How is that not a conflict of interest, number one? That's the same thing as Trump sending people to his hotels and him going back to his own hotel almost damn near every weekend. We are paying him to go home to his own place. That alone should tell you a lot. Um, what did you say, Comcast? Oh, Obama bank bailout. Pardon me, Bush administration. Uh, you gotta explain that one. I think you're. I think you're, I'm trying to see where you're trying to go with that one, yours. But um. But aside from that, uh, moving right along, and this is another thing that, again, Republicans are going to have to explain because they're in part to this, that currently our, our federal deficit is reaching $1 trillion. I mean, currently it sits at $984.4 billion, but it is uh, starting to add that way in the coming years. It will be over a trillion dollars that we'll still be in debt. And the thing about it is, which I love that people are going, I'm going to point this out every chance I get because they can't argue with it. The reason it went up 26% was basically because of Trump's tax cuts. And that's the point that I wanted to make clear. Keep in mind, Trump did put out a, did put out a tax plan a couple, uh, about a year ago. Um, where he, uh, about, I'm sorry, two years ago, 2017, he put out two years ago about his tax plan. He said that it would make everybody money. He said that it would, he said that it would increase the economy. He said that it would take care of the budget. He sat there and said so much shit, not realizing, hey, we're going to cut the middle and lower classes out. We're going to get the top percent everything they want. We're going to get the, we're going to the military everything they want. Oh, at the same time, we're going to turn around and take away all those bonuses that y'all love, those tax cuts that you love so much. But it's going to be great because we're going to get the people who have the means to do it. And it's just going to, and I was like, please don't say trickle down. Trickle down, econ trickle down economics never works. Reagan economics never works. It has been proven time and time again, this conservative pipe dream that if you overload the top, it'll trickle down to the bottom. No, not if, the, not if it's a wine glass. Not if it's a wine glass with a crack in it. It doesn't work that way. So... Again, the simple fact of the matter is that actual budget, which got railroaded through, which got railroaded through Congress, mind you, that for simple fact of the matter is just that we're now seeing the we're now seeing the end of it. We're now seeing the fruits of this man's labor. I mean, yeah, he's made a shitload of money, but at the same time, we are all hurting. I mean, the income gap has gotten wider. The only people that have actually benefited from this Trump tax plan is that if you're above the 100, 110K line or you're a business or corporation. You're the only guys that have profited from the, from the last two years. Bravo. The rest of us are starting to see it's like you're, you're almost like the, you're the working poverty at this point. And that alone should say something else. But um, going right along, guys, um, this other story which I found interesting is simple fact of the matter is um, there is a major league umpire that put in a tweet, and the tweet was basically him saying, I will be buying an AR-15 tomorrow, but if you impeach my president this way, you will have another civil war. Hashtag MAGA 2020, which he tried to go back and delete. Um, this is an umpire that's in a major league baseball. Major league baseball, and he's doing that. And then, of course, we all knew the apology was coming. Where he sat there and said, he said, I want to personally apologize to anyone that made my words feel less safe. I acknowledge and apologize for this controversy that's brought to my Major League Baseball, my fellow umpires, my family. I never intended to diminish the threat of violence from assault weapons or violence from any kind. I am going to learn from this. Um, 
I will be buying an F-15 tomorrow. But if you impeach my president this way, you will have another Civil War MAGA 2020. By the way, Civil does not have an A in it. I swear. Look, I'm going to be honest. For a lot of Trump supporters, you guys can't spell shit. <clears throat> civil? Civil? We're going to have another Civil Law. It, no, it, it doesn't sound right. It it's It's I, not A. But... He tried to sit there and say, well, it's violent. Well, I'm not trying to incite. I'm, I don't want people to think this is violence or this is a threat. If you impeach my president, I'm going to buy an AR-15 tomorrow and you will have another civil war. Hmm, how is that not a threat? I'm just curious. I really am. I hope the man actually loses his job. I'm going to be honest with you. Any man that has any guy that's in that situation honestly needs to lose his job. At that point, here's the thing. Once, it, once you do a threat of violence, that is a threat of violence. You hear that, Twitter? That is a threat of violence. Once that happens, that, that, at that point, it's like, no, you can't be associated with Major League Baseball. You're out. So I assume he'll be fired eventually just because of the fact of the matter. Um, it needs to happen. It does. I mean, because Major League Baseball... I'll be honest with you. If Major League Baseball stands by this man, then... What does it say about Major League Baseball? I mean, that really, I mean, what does it really say? Uh, but so the fact of the matter is just that the man himself literally got caught, you know, he got caught boasting his views, but like I always say, like I always say on this show and my other podcast, whatever you say, you better be ready to stand on it and be ready to say, accept the consequences of it all. And apparently he wasn't because that no, he knew his job was in line for this. So good luck at the appointment line, Doc. But anyway, that's going to be our that's going to basically be our uh, topic today. So we're just going to get to our feel good news segment. Um, what is our good news? Name? What is our good news segment? Good news. I'm sorry, it's like a Trump supporter. What is our good news segment? Is just that for simple fact of the matter is I know on the how the fact we got here we do talk a lot about things. Sometimes are dark, sometimes are gloomy. You know, and this is the weekend. We don't want to leave you guys on a good. We don't want to leave you guys on that on that tip. We want to leave you feeling good, feeling great. Even though it's raining in Tennessee right now, and probably raining in other parts of, of of the country, we're still trying to bring a little sunshine, trying to make you know feel good about things and restore your faith in humanity. And I have to give my friend Alex for this, my friend Alex credit for this because um, I meant to find this video earlier earlier the, in the week, but he found it for me and actually gave it to me. Um, I still think this is great. This is this is honestly great. Is what this basically is. So what actually happened was this one kid um, in Oregon High School was going to commit suicide um, by bringing a gun to school. He had no intention of killing anybody. He actually got people. He actually got people to leave the room. And this coach does the one. This coach is so freaking brave. I have to give this man credit. That he is so brave that he literally goes in, disarms the guy, and he hugs him. And he still has the gun. He gives it to, he gives it to the resource officer, who turns around and you know is getting away from the gun. He's just keeping the kid and he's hugging him, hugging him and consoling him, just because of the fact this kid was about to off himself. And every time, and every and you can see the kid almost like he's gonna run, like he's gonna run. The guy just keeps hugging him. And it's just the fact that he's like, and I just thought to myself when I'm sitting there watching that, number one, that's brave. That is brave as shit, number one. Because I don't care what no one sit there and says. You know, when when foot's put to fire, you're going to either fight or flight. And this guy decides that he's going to help this guy, even though this guy was willing to off himself. And and the fact that it was a child, dude, it's just one of those things to where you just can't help but 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 feel you know there's there's some people out there that are willing to save others, especially what he said afterwards. Man, it's awesome! It's awesome. Um, as you can imagine, it's been it's been a tough tough weekend for, for for all of us really you know everybody in in Oregon and, and a lot of people around the country um, I've been getting a lot of love from 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 all around the country because this is this is such a you know a story that that usually ends in tragedy and this is this is you know from God's will that this this ended up well you 
you know, it was, it's a scary situation. Um, you know, we were in the headlines, but we were in the headlines, and it wasn't a tragedy. So that I'm just thankful for that. What and then how did you find your how did you find yourself in the classroom that day? Like how you got to the classroom from where you were in the school and all that? Can you walk us through kind of what happened real quick? Yeah. So I, I mean, there's there's the main building at Park Rose, and then there's the Fab building, the Fine Arts building, which is a little walk, uh, kind of walk past the football field. So. Um, you know, I walk out there, I get a call to, to go grab a student. Um, you know, I get 30, 40 calls every day to just grab random students to take them down to the office and, you know, pass messages, deliver notes, all that stuff. Uh, so it's just another random, you know, regular call uh, to go grab a student out in the fab building. And, uh, you know, I walk in there, I get to the classroom. Um, you know, it's, I'm in the classroom for, for 15, 20 seconds. You know, I, I ask the teacher, is this, is this student here? We kind of look around. Uh, students not there. Um, you know, after about after I'm in the classroom for, for 20 seconds, um, the door opens, and you know I'm I'm within arm's length of the door. Uh, you know, about three feet away from the door, and and the uh, you know there's there's a, a kid with a gun, a, a shotgun, uh, as soon as that door opens. So, um, pretty crazy situation. You know, in a fraction of a second, uh, I analyzed everything really fast. I saw the look in his face, look in his eyes, looked at the gun, I realized it was a real gun. And then my instincts just took over. Um, you know, I, I lunged for the gun, put two hands on the gun, and, and he had his two hands on the gun. And obviously the, the students are, you know, in, you know, running out of the classroom and, and screaming. And, um, you know, I'm just making sure that barrel of the gun is, isn't pointing towards them or towards me. And, um, you know, I was able to, to wrestle it away and, and uh, you know, kind of kind of save the day. Everyone's using the word hero. And right and, I mean, like I said, you got to give the guy props. I have to give him props to the fact of the matter is, not only was he able to successfully keep the kid from hurting himself, but to keep the kid from hurting others. And that itself, the way everybody walked away, you, you got to give that man props. I actually give that man a drink, because I know after all that said and done, he was like, I, I need to... Woo! I'm, I was like, you never... Like I said, you never know with these kids. And again, I love the fact that he just sat there and was like, Nobody's dying today. That to me kind of restored my faith in humanity a little bit. Um, but moving right along, guys, uh, Halloween is coming up. We're not too far off from that. So a lot of kids are going to be trick or treating and whatnot. And I think this woman has seriously won the Halloween decoration for her house. Um, I feel bad if your children watch Sesame Street. <laughs> Yes, I feel bad for any anybody that takes their two or three year old over there that recognizes Cookie Monster and then suddenly realize you're about to be eaten by Cookie Monster, not realize it's just the door. So I give props to the person on that one; it was very well done. But at the same time, I feel bad for any kid that's about to, um, whoo, they're about to walk up and see that because you know either you're gonna have a very either you're gonna know exactly what type of kid you are or you're gonna have to or you're gonna be able to. Be able to pay for therapy because you got to explain. We got to go inside Cookie Monster to get cookies. Good luck with that parenting. Um, speaking of other stories, I always find this funny. I always say, I always, I dig. I am a little bit of a hopeless romantic, and I find this interesting about this story, um, where even the headline: one-time prom dates finally marry sixty years later. Um, long story short, uh, eighty years old, they were basically had. Their one only date was a senior prom. Um, and after that, they kind of went their separate ways. But at age 80, they're able to call each other husband and wife. And they met as high school juniors. They went to the prom. After that, uh, they both went on to marry other people, have families. Apparently, after 2017, this man went searching for his woman on Google, searching for her on Google, and then found out that she too was a widow. And so. I'm not saying the man took it as a green light. I'm just saying the man just uh, wanted to reconnect. And then after that, um, after seeing her a card, getting information, 
he took a 500 mile trip to visit her at home and then from there um they went ahead and got married um they went ahead and got married and uh pretty much been happy after that so at 80 years old i have realized that sure 80 years old you can get married anytime you want to i just thought it was i thought it was a wonderful story um that involved a man and google so guys if you you know for all those that think you lost your love and you think she's all right and you think that you might got a shot hey i'm not saying be a stalker i'm just saying hey you can try to find her you can try to reconnect just don't be a stalker that's all i'm saying don't don't be a perv i mean i'm not saying that guy was a perv but i'm just saying he reached out and he's he used uh he used Google to find his lost love and come to find out she's a widow. And he said, well, shit, we already had one date. I mean, I'll go ahead and give another date a shot. <coughs> but um, I'm just saying that's beautiful and that's wonderful and I can't get a text back. Um, so the last story I got is one that I keep finding stories like this and I call them integrity stories. Um, because you never know. You never know what somebody will do in a situation. I wish it happened to me. But the story I'm talking about is that uh, is that a uh, clerk at a, Play at a Plato's closet was basically emptying out a uh, emptying out the pockets of a person that just handed over some clothes. Unfortunately, one of the pockets contained several thousand dollars in a bankroll. When she counted it out, it was seven thousand dollars. So, of course, she did the she so the so the clerk did the right thing. She turned around, called her boss, and said, "Hey, there's a large sum of money in this box in this thing I found." So, she then decided to uh, with, with with her and her manager try to reach out to the jacket's owner and return the money to them because he forgot that he had put it there. According to that, so so let's be honest here, guys. Um, so let, let's be honest here, and I, I I I feel like we can be honest. If you told me that I found a jacket, or a jacket was turned into a store I was working for, and money is in the jacket, and a bankroll, a roll, you know, you know those, you know, you always, you know, those hip hop videos where they have the rolls and whatnot with the fact stacks, with the money clips, shit like that. So a roll. Seven thousand dollars. Let's say, <clears throat> let's say seven thousand dollars is found. What do you do? And I'm not saying either way is wrong because it's not stealing. The, you you can argue this any way up from down street. It's not stealing if you found it because you didn't see you didn't see the person drop the money. You didn't even know the person had the money. All you saw was the individual. All you saw was the individual trading their money, trading their clothes. At a, at a consignment store, and I'm like all good consignment stores, you have to check it, you have to check it, you have to make sure it goes enough to get washed and dry clean and things of that nature. You find seven thousand dollars. The way I see it, that's a blessing. I and, I and I'll be honest, with you, I wouldn't turn in. I am going to be so honest with you right now. I would not turn in any money that I found because I found it. I felt that it was. I felt that it was fate's way of saying, "Here you go, have a break." Seven thousand dollars can definitely go a long way in many cases, but again, I'm that type of cat that wouldn't do it. I'm almost certain out there that there are individuals, um, individuals who will turn in. And let me say this off the bat: there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with the fact. The matter is, if you want to turn it in, and if you want to do that, and because you think it's the right thing to do, I'm never going to knock you for that. I'm not. I will try not to question you. <laughs> I will try, but I'm not gonna knock you for it. Because again, like guys like me, just like that story of that one that one person that was on a bus and found an envelope that had well over twenty grand in it in cash. Twenty grand in cash, she turned it in. Had it been me, I would have sat there and just said, you know what? I'm taking that seven thousand dollars, not to bless it. But again, not knocking the person who did it, but I just love those integrity stories because they always say that person, well, if you kept it, that's stealing. I, no, it's not. It's not stealing at all. You just happen to come across money that just, hey, you know what it is? For, uh, yeah, and, I, and I would challenge that. I'm like, you're going to there and tell me how finding, is money found on the ground different than finding money in pockets or things of that nature? 
That, that's all I'm going to say. How is it different? You tell me how is it different, I'll go from there. But again, I just thought that was a cool story. But that's all we got, guys, here for How the Fabric Got Here. So thank you guys for all watching. Uh, just some shameless plugs before we get out of here. I'm not the only cat that actually has podcasts. I'll start my friend Vaughn, uh, A. Uh, that White Westpoon on Facebook, BBZA. on YouTube. Has several podcasts of his own. He actually has the I Get That Reference, uh, B, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, I Get That Reference BST podcast. What is the BST? It is a podcast that goes over several new, several bits of news. That news can be video games, that news can be trailers, that news can be music. Pretty much wants to keep you informed in an interactive show just like mine. He also has Rhythm Niss, which will actually be a little bit later today uh, here with the rest of us. Um, Rhythm Niss is where you can reminisce over the rhythm in which he goes over musical albums, uh, both past and present, and grades to a four-tier system. If you want to know what the four-tier system is, you have to watch Rhythm Niss to find out. He also has Random as Fuck with Uncle Beezy. What is Random as Fuck? Random as Fuck is the pool of ratchets we sometimes dip our toes into to basically take a break from life and have a chuckle. Some videos make you think, some videos make you cry, some videos are still unbeatable. Like the video that's currently on hip hop, that's currently on World Star right now, of a Burger King employee, a Burger King person at a Burger King drive through. The Burger King is on fire. They're still waiting for the change. The employees are outside watching this happen because the individual is still at the Burger King. I wish I could make that up. But again, all those shows can be found under uh, under Vaughn's Facebook or under his under his YouTube. Um, also, uh, if you do have, if you're an upcoming artist and you want your music to be played on Rhythmness under in Vaughn Step Into the Ring. Please, oh please, uh, send that and please uh, reach out to him on Facebook or YouTube, and he'll give you the details on how you can do so. Um, aside from that, he uh, aside from that, my other buddy who will be uh, hopefully doing his podcast later will be uh, Thomas Reed, aka Mountain Puncher, will be doing his To Be Determined podcast. What is To Be Determined? To Be Determined is all about fitness. If you've ever seen Thomas before, Thomas stays in the gym all damn week. Not that I'm complaining. But um, he loves to talk about things, fitness, loves to talk about nutrition, workouts, what works, what doesn't work, and just certain things that we just happen to see that are kind of a no-no in the fitness and gym world. Like that one dude that's always being so close to a woman when she squats. Yes, you know who you are. Um, aside from that, um, that'll actually be uh, um, at 3 p.m. a little bit later day on Facebook Live. Just look up Thomas Reed and go from there. Also, my other buddy Trace, who has a couple podcasts of his own. He actually has a Smoke of Truth, as I like to call it. The Smoke of Truth is the Check Your Ego at the Door podcast, in which few dare to tread because Trace does go in on certain subjects, but he only goes in on those for those who are willing to talk about it and not be easily offended. So if you're one of those that can sit there and be ready to really talk, then the Smoke of the Smoke, uh, Smoke Truth podcast is for you because as I always said Trace wants all the smoke. Aside from that he also has the bump down with his music culture knowledge and numbers in which Trace also goes over what's hot on the charts, what's hot on the underground upcoming artists as well as giving his insight on the recording industry and certain topics. Um, so definitely that's also active on Facebook and YouTube just look up Trace Brown on Facebook DJ Key and Wayne on YouTube. Aside from that my other buddy uh, has his own gaming channel Wingnut Gaming in which he plays Apex Legends, Call of Duty, um Sometimes Fortnite, his choice, not mine, and sometimes Battlefield. But again, a very social guy. I do play with him from time to time on Apex Legends and Battlefield, and his likes to socialize via from there. So just look up William Ewing Nut Gun Gaming on Facebook when you get there and like, share, and subscribe. Speaking of like, share, and subscribe, guys, we all have YouTube pages now. So, um,. If you do look up, oh, before I get the YouTube pages, I almost forgot to promote my damn self. Um, aside from that, um, of course, my show, I have the Fracker Guy, here is every Saturday from 10 a.m. to noon. Um, also, my other show, which will be a little bit later tonight, will be the Off Limits Podcast, um, which it's the podcast that goes there. I've always sat there and said, I believe that we have been told a long time ago that we can't talk about sex, politics, religion, and things of that nature because that makes people uncomfortable and therefore wants to avoid uncomfortable situations. I think a lack of those uncomfortable situations have led to a lack of civil conversation because lately all you see is people yelling at each other, yelling over each other, trying to get their points across, nobody's listening. I do believe that as long as we're able to have the fortitude to go ahead and go into those conversations, be able to talk about the subjects nobody will talk about, but be able to do it in a civilized manner, we'll be able to finally be comfortable with the uncomfortable situations and be able to introduce civility back into our conversations. And that's what Off Limits Podcast is all about, um, which will be later tonight from uh, 8 p.m. up until 10, also live on Facebook and YouTube. And like I said, Speaking of YouTube, we definitely need you to like, share, and subscribe. Like, share, and subscribe. All YouTube pages. What I mean by that is, if you look up How the Frack We Got Here, if you look up Alphabet's Podcast, if you look up DJ King Eddie Wayne, if you look up Big BZA Dot Podcast, if you look up To Be Determined, that is number two. That is the TBH. That is Terra Bravo Hotel. Well, actually, that's terrible, and I just got to talk about spelling. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm sorry. Let me try it again because Thomas's YouTube page is a little, a little interesting. So to find the to be determined page, it is literally the number two, the letter T, and BD to be determined. Um, so that's Tara. So that's Tara Bravo Delta to be determined podcast. We do ask guys that we are trying to like, share, and subscribe. If you like it, share it. If you may not like it, go ahead and share it. There might be people out there that you know it might not be your cup of tea, but it might be their cup of tea. And all of this, like I said, we're trying to branch out, try to show people what we can do from the table of bosses. So with that being said, guys, um, the last thing I'll say about how the fact we got here is all about staying informed. Staying informed means that you're not only just looking at it at face value, you're really going in trying to find the information that matters. You're trying to go ahead and form up to find the truth and the hopes of doing so bring it to somebody else to basically encourage them to do the same. Because an informed community can make a lot of better decisions than an uninformed one because an uninformed one got us Trump and that is how the fact we got here. So thank you guys for all watching this live and also if you're watching on the playback, feel free to comment as uh, as if you was loud on your Trump supporters will. And also on the watch party, uh, I apologize about you guys commenting I will try to get to where I can have the watch party and the live stream go at the same time so I can be able to catch everybody's comments. So, that being said, guys, hope you guys have a wonderful Saturday. Um, try to stay dry if it's raining in your area. And if it's snowing, you lucky people, have fun. Aside from that, thanks for watching, guys.